So we're gonna start today with like uh, with like uh, yeah, that's not the way we should start, huh? We're gonna start with mechanical properties. Strength. You've heard that word before, right? What is strength? The ability of a metal to resist changing its shape or size when external forces are applied. So there's a force on it. It's the ability to resist changing shape or size when that force is put on. However it's put on. There are four types of stresses. There's coronavirus stress. I'm just kidding. That's a real deal. Tensile. If you don't know what tensile stress is, or tensile strength, that's bad. Scale of 1 to 10, you're up there around a 10. A stress that pulls something apart. And I will show you what the, how our tensile polar works here in a short but sweet video. And then we'll have you all do a tensile pull next class. We'll line you up one at a time so you can say you've actually done one. Because if you don't know it after you've done a tensile pull, you haven't, there's no chance. You're never going to know it. So. You might try to keep it down to nine. Negative. <laughs> Compression. People don't usually think of compression as a stress on, uh, well, sorry, I forgot to do the formula. That's going to screw you right up. Tensile strength equals Maximum load divided by keep it all the same cross sectional area. So that would be inches. Squared. And let's go ahead and do. There we go. Add the word be there. Guess we're going to have to do this. So, max load divided by cross sectional area. So, when you rip it apart, it's going to say, let's just say 10,000 pounds. It took to rip it apart. <laughs> Then you're going to measure with a caliper the cross-sectional area. So you're going to measure the thickness versus the width. You're going to divide it. That's going to give you your pounds per square inch tensile strength, right? So your max load is pounds. Your cross-sectional area is square inches. That's where you get your pounds per square inch, right? Compression. Stress that pushes something together. Think of a pillow. Push it, squishes, right? 
The same thing happens to steel on a much smaller level, right? I used to have a piece of memory foam. There was a kid that worked at Serta. And we'd push it and sheer stress. It's the same thing for all cross-sectional area. People can usually figure out or see sheet in their minds shear stress a lot better because we have shears out there. And it's basically a pair of scissors, right, for steel or aluminum or stainless. Shear stress, let's measure. By applying and opposing load perpendicular to the axes of grain flow. That's the book definition. So shear strength, oops. This again, max load divided by your cross section. Is measured, shear strap is measured by applying an opposing low perpendicular to the X grain flow. That is the book definition. What is it really? A pair of scissors, right? That's what it's doing. Metal really doesn't have that great of a, a shear stress. If you have the, when you think about it, we got a shear out there that'll shear off an inch thick plate like nothing, and it's 55 ton. It's not that big of a freaking press, right? It does all right. It's better than plastic, right? Oh, that's some pretty hard plastic. Torsion. Torsion strength, the torsion stress. Stress that twists a material. We do have a torsion tester out there, but it's always busted, so I don't do much with it. It was made back in, you know, the 60s. We used to have a tinsel puller, and it said, when I first got here, it was a huge footprint, too. And it said, um, by footprint, I mean it took up a huge amount of space, and it was 200,000 pounds per square inch capacity. No, not 200,000 pounds, dude. Per square inch, it was 200,000 pounds is what was capable of pulling. That's pretty big, right? Hydraulic, of course, big footprint, and it had a tag on it that said, calibration due October 1982. So it was due to be calibrated in 1982 again. I took all this time, got it working. I was putting all kinds of stuff in there. Boom, you know, breaking it. The gauge never ever worked, so we got rid of it. And now we have one with a 10,000 pound capability. It's electric. And they convinced me to get it because you won't have to do any maintenance on it because of that, there's no hydraulics. Well, I didn't realize how weak 10,000 pounds is. It's very weak. You can't put a, a well, usually we do it with, for well testing, but it's a, you have to neck it down so far I mean, it's a quarter of an inch by the time you get it knocked down on a well to where you can actually pull it. And there is, in the codes, certain neck sizes for doing tinsel pulls, so you can't neck it down. They make it big enough to where, you know, you have to meet the code. Torsion strength, it's a specimen. Let's look it up. Here we go.
Tensile poles all look the same. It's going to have a neck down area. See that? Neck down area. This looks like a, uh, there's ASME certified ones that you can buy. And they have threads right here to thread in. Those are for the, the MEC Tech students. Right there is the one. See it? It's all threaded. They're just looking at different materials and see the di different tensile of strength. For the welding students, they're going to be doing this right here. I know it says 3D prints, but that's what it is. Neck down and flat and right in here is a weld. And they're going to try and break the weld. If it breaks in the weld, you fail. It's supposed to be the strongest part, right? See right there? Weld zone. With the Mac Tech students, they get these for different materials, so they'll compare the difference between cast iron, low carbon steel, aluminum. They're all the same size, just different materials. Because they don't care where it breaks. That's just a random specimen. They're going to look at things like percent elongation. So if you put in a piece of low carbon steel, it's going to stretch a little bit before it breaks. If you put cast iron in there, it sounds like a shotgun going off. It doesn't stretch at all, and it just goes boom and breaks, and it's a real clean break. And the, the Mac Tech students will look at and analyze the stretching and the breaks. It's real clean. It's a hard material, right? And it stretches. It's more ductile. Gauge length. I was looking to see if they had... Aluminum ones. There's all different kinds of them. These ones are the ones they use. They're ASME certified. ASME is the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. Torsion. These will have a little triangles, the ones we have. Those triangles? Those are square, I guess. Same thing. You gotta be able to grip it, right? To be able to twist it. So those are torsions. See any of the ones we had out there? Kind of looks like this right here, but it's, ours is a triangle one. So this was a, a triangle. Not gonna give me one. Anyways, compression they don't do as much testing on because it's so strong. To compress a piece of steel, you gotta have. Yeah. Huge amounts of force. So we've said stress a lot, right? What is stress? Believe it or not, this is the book definition. Definition is applied. To metal, it changes the shape. You may not be able to see it. You might change it just a little bit. Like we're talking about with compression, you can put a huge amount of force on a piece of steel, and, it's, and you're not going to really, by, by the eye, be able to see it, unless you, know, you have it in something major. But it is changing shape. You just can't see it. Strain. Change. In shape. Expressed in inches of deformation. Per inch of material length. The change in shape expressed in inches of deformation per inch of material length. So you're straining your material. It's just this, how much it actually. Moves. The 
there's strain that comes back, there's strain that doesn't come back, you went too far, it permanently deforms it, right? Elasticity, that's what we're talking about with elasticity, right? Everybody knows what elasticity is, right? Because they show it to you and what? What do they, what do they pull out of their pocket in science? A rubber band, right? Here you go. This is COVID elasticity. You like that? You pull that through, come back all day long on a rubber band, right? With, with metals, not so much, right? So elasticity is the ability of a material to strain. Under a load. And then return. To its original. All these strain and stresses and forces are looked at when engineering is done, right? They got to figure out if they need a material to come back to its original shape under the load. Especially important when you're building like buildings, right? Things like that. Parts that are going to come out that, I don't know, people are standing on. Like you want to figure out if a catwalk, right, is able to blow in the wind and not permanently get deformed, right? Elastic limit. Greatest load a material can withstand and spring back to its original shape. So there's a point where it's not going to come back, right? Even with a rubber band, you can snap a rubber band, right? Now there's that point, the elastic limit, and then there's the factor of fatigue into it that could change, right? That's where you have catastrophic failure below the elastic limit, right? If you pound on this desk a billion times, eventually it's going to break, right? Maybe, maybe not. That's where engineering comes in. They're gonna look at things like FEAs, things like that. You ever heard of the finite element analysis? It was getting big when I was graduating, but now they, it's pretty uh, standard operation now. Finite, there it is. So they have computer systems that they're gonna put your part in. You can see right here, that's obviously a rod, right? So they put this into the computer system, they're going to draw it probably in SolidWorks or engineering or pro engineer or whatever 3D print system you're drawing in. And then they put a certain amount of force on this and it gives you a readout of where it's going to fail. There's a good one. So this is a fan, right? Where would a fan blade fail? Right there in the corner, right? That's why it's all red. If you had something hit this fan when it was going, where would it fraction? Right down here, right? That's a pretty obvious one. What else we got? There's an engine. Oh, an airplane. It's gonna fail. 
An elephant. Where's the elephant going to fail? <laughs> There's a good example. It's an I-beam. We used to do these where they would say an I-beam is here attached to the wall through a weld. We're going to put this amount of load on it way out here. And then the FEA would show where it was going to fracture, if it was going to fracture, how much pounds it would take to fracture it. A chain, right? If you were pulling this in tinsel, right in here is where it's going to fracture, right? It's going to stretch a little bit, maybe. Eventually, it's going to fracture if you were looking at that. I got a knee in here. A wrench, that's a beautiful thing. Anybody ever break a wrench before? Right about there? That's where it's going to break, according to this FDA. Human bones. So if, if Bo Jackson weighs 230 pounds, and in the combine he ran a 4.1240, and he hits you with his shoulder, we can do an FBA on that. Because you can calculate the force through your physics class that you guys love, right? Who's going to be the test dummy there? No! We can give him a cut. My, my, my metro will be the test dummy. We'll see if it tips over. Bo Jackson has going 4-1-2 at 230 pounds of the shoulder of this area. What are the foot pounds in this area, A? And where is the metro going to fail? Could you be a crazy crack working across the street. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, my God. Visco elastic lag. Whoops. This is where I used to bring out the memory foam that somebody stole it, probably used it for a pillow. Visco elastic lag means the closer a material. comes to its elastic limit the longer it will take to go back to its original shape. You take it to the last limit, the longer it's going to take to bounce back, right? With a piece of memory foam, I used to put my hand in it and then it would take like a minute. It will work on a my pillow. Smith, weren't you the one that said you liked the my pillow? It's pretty good. Man. It's a pretty good pillow? I don't know. I think it's worth it. We're going to sell some my pillows on the internet right now. Did you get the welding hoodies in yet? <laughs> totally off topic. <laughs> we'll talk about that later, Steve. Right? I was just thinking about it, though. I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> when you start talking about selling something, then wait a minute. Yield point. Hopefully, somebody has seen this. Anybody ever seen this graph before? No. Nobody's ever seen it? I've seen it. You've seen it? All right, good. I'm glad somebody has. Yeah. This is kind of a, I don't want to say famous, but it's a pretty well-known graph, right? So you have stress over here. You have strain going this way, right? It goes up at a pretty steady pace, and then your yield point hits. And it goes down a little bit. Then it gets tougher, believe it or not. Goes up and then it starts going down until it fractures, right? I could put some of your grades in this, I'm just kidding. Until you fracture, that's a failure, right? And every material is going to be a little bit different depending on. So, right there is a good one. That's your elastic region, right? That's where it's going to pop back. 
When you get to the yield point, it's all over. When the elastic limit is exceeded, it is called the yield point. Entrada. Sometimes you want to go past that, right? If you had to make a U and a piece of, I don't know, brown stock, you want it to go past the yield point, right? That is the plastic range. Low carbon steel is very ductile, right? You can bend it, it's not going to break. Especially if you heat it up, right? So plastic range, or stresses beyond the elastic limit that are still useful. That is shown in this graph right here, right? Anybody ever break a piece of fence wire and you bend it back and forth? And bend it 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 and then eventually it breaks? It takes a while, doesn't it? And the reason that it breaks is because every time you bend it, you're squishing the one side, right? You're squishing it, you're work hardening it, then you're work hardening the other side, then you're work hardening the other side. With hardness comes what? Brittleness, that's the next thing we got. And as you're hardening that, it's getting brittle and eventually it breaks. It gets hot too, right? You burn your fingers. Put that energy into it. Materials. That will not deform plastically. Brittle is danger, right? Can be. When, when I first started here back in like 2005 or six or one of them years, they had this big giant rack in the back and it was full of tool steel that they got donated from random companies. And they made a ball drop ball for the ice arena. So the New Year's ball drop, you know what I'm talking about? I'm sure you've all seen that. They welded it. They took steel out of that when I was in Miami. And it was tool steel. They hit it with a fork truck and it broke like glass. And that was above people's heads. Dangerous, right? Because it was brittle. When you weld tool steel, you're basically turning that into martensite on the sides of wherever you weld. They can't take that. So, I will heat up, I think I have a piece of tool steel that I'll heat up and I'll video it and show you how it, it's, it's almost it's pretty scary because you can hit it with a hammer and it'll bend right over. But as soon as I hit it and quench it and turn it to martensite, you hit it with a hammer and it just shatters like glass. So it's very dangerous. Brittleness can be useful. We've talked about kind of how um, Brittleness usually comes with hardness, so if you need something that's abrasion resistant, you might turn it into a brittle microstructure that way, you're sliding stuff over it, and it won't eat away at the material. Where brittle's dangerous is impact, right? You hit it with a hammer, it's going to break. If you have a piece of cast iron, you just cut a piece of pipe out there, and you put it in the vise, and you hit it with a hammer, it just shatters. But you could take something across it all day long and it wouldn't erode. So it all depends on the application, right? 
may want brittleness, may really not want brittleness. Stiffness. Is expressed through the modulus of elasticity. Hopefully you've heard that before. Oops. Modulus of elasticity. Also called Young's modulus. Modulus of elasticity in the city. Stress divided by strain. Anybody ever heard of the modulus of elasticity before? Not in the chemistry course, you understand? I only took mine half the semester. <laughs> I only went to that class half the time, so no, I didn't get to that yet. Duck utility. Allows a metal. Form permanently. So you bend it, right? Good, malleability next. Yeah, we'll go over malleability and then we'll call it a day for notes. I'll show you the tinsel pull I want to show you. Malleability and ductility are very close. Ductile materials are very malleable. Malleable materials are usually pretty ductile. Malleability. The ability to deform under compressive loads. So you can squish it, right? Ductile is more bending. This is more squishing, if that makes sense. Or the ability to be pounded. <laughs> yeah, keep it keep PG-13. People think of that because of like blacksmithing, right? It's malleable, you can pound it into a shape and very similar. similar. Malleability and ductility run hand in hand. So next class we're going to go into fracture toughness, fatigue, uh, some thermal stuff, and we will um, look at three real life cases and we're going to either blame the engineer or not blame the engineer. One's the twin towers, one's that bridge that goes all cattywamp, whatever that word is, cattywampus. 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 And then I think I had another one, I don't remember what it is though. I'll have to Look at the notes. We're going to either blame the engineer or give him a pass. All right? So we're going to look at our tinsel pull here now.